Welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast with your host, Scott McMahon. Hi, and welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast, filmmaking freedom for the independent. This is a podcast where we focus on making and selling your film for online self-distribution. A perfect way to get started is to pick up the book, How to Make and Sell Your Film Online and Survive the Hollywood Implosion, while doing it. It's available as a paperback, in Kindle ebook, as well as an audiobook. In fact, you can get the audiobook for free when you go to survivetheimplosion.com. When you go to that link, you can sign up with Audible for their free trial and get the book for free. Again, that's at survivetheimplosion.com. Today's episode is entitled How to Predict Disruptions in the Entertainment Industry with my special guest, Gabriella Mirabelli, who is the host of the Up Next podcast show. And Up Next is described as new ideas and new technology are causing seismic shifts in the media industry. Meet the innovators, the risk takers, and the disruptors on the front lines of change from Hollywood, Wall Street, Silicon Valley, and beyond. And that is what Gabriella's podcast is all about. In addition, Gabrielle is the CEO and co-founder of Anatomy, a New York-based Emmy Award-winning creative agency and branding consultancy where she specializes in the promotion and marketing of world-class entertainment brands through trailers and other media content. Her clients include Amazon, FX Networks, National Geographic, NBC Universal, Smithsonian Channel, Sundance TV, TNT, and USA Network. As you'll hear in the interview, she has also made an award-winning documentary on the art of John Eric Broadus called Books of Survival. Now, Gabriella has had a lot of tremendous guests on her podcast that are operating at high levels in the field of digital media, technology, film, television, virtual reality, gaming, and the list goes on and on and on. I wanted to get a bigger perspective of where the industry might be headed uh, and what these big media companies want out of content creators like yourself and to see if there was any way to predict where the disruptions might take place and where we fit into the whole scheme of things. So without further ado, here is Gabrielle Mirabelli here on the Film Trooper podcast. I was curious, what is it, you've interviewed all these amazing guests on your podcast, and is there sort of a defining like summary? <laughs> is there a method in the madness? <laughs> yes, that's fair. <laughs> Which one of these things is not like the other? Well, um, let me back up a bit. I, so I have a company called Anatomy, and we're a marketing and promotions firm for entertainment brands. And we create the trailers and spots that entice viewers to binge watch programs. Um, and we also create business to business marketing reels to launch channels, pitch investors, secure advertisers. And we consult with the networks as well about organizational structure and where millennial viewing is going and what that might mean. Um, and what's happening is, as every, I don't know, every media journal will say, is there's, there's a lot of change going on. Um, there's a real shift in how people are consuming media. It's disrupting the business models. And what this means is our clients are increasingly under pressure, but as part of being under pressure, they're actually getting more tunnel vision. They're having more and more meetings. They're more and more tied up. And when you think about trying to future proof or solve a problem, uh, you can only bring to bear those tools which you already have. And you can recombine them, but you're still working with whatever those tools and experiences are. So what's a way that you can expand your, your tool chest is by talking to other people, learning best practices from industries which are different from yours but might have overlaps um, or people who are doing innovative things. Now, not everybody has a lot of time to do that. So what I did was I created, I wanted to create a place uh, to have those conversations. And that's the origin of the podcast, the Up Next podcast. And so in general, what I look for are people who are either in media or um, have business models which remind me of the business models that we're dealing with in media. They've maybe been through disruption in a different way. Um, and I talk to them about that unique thing that they're doing or what they're seeing. And I try to draw parallels back to what's happening in media. And, and then these conversations are just housed and they exist so that people can dip in and out when they want to. They can listen to the people they're interested in. Maybe they're interested in leadership, but not 
culture. Maybe they're interested in culture, but not, um, you know, uh, analytics. So it, it really is there to, to be a resource for folks. Oh, very nice. So from all like the interviews you've done so far, um, has there been a surprise in terms of a perspective change in terms of what disruption means to you, like when you first started to where you are now? Not really. I mean, I, I think um, it's reinforced a lot of the things. I mean, disruption tends to happen not head to head. It comes at oblique angles. Because any business that's existing is aware of its direct competition. And so an assault, a, an upstart that's in the same space, playing in the same way, is evident. It's the thing that you don't really even pay attention to because it's so strange. Snapchat, <laughs> for instance. You yeah. know, that all of a sudden you're like, what? It's taking over the universe. And it comes at it in odd ways. And it's because... Um, successful businesses are the ones that did get disrupted in one sense because media had been so successful was printing money practically it missed what it's it missed where the gaps were because it was doing so well it didn't need to notice where the gaps were i mean this was true with newspapers newspapers could be wildly sloppy with their money because the classifieds were just feeding them tons and tons of revenue and then Craigslist, you know, and then overnight this huge revenue stream gone. Yeah. Yeah. What other, um, for like the creators, like you said, you're also a filmmaker yourself. You have made a film and you're making these films now, but in the context of, um, for media companies, um, what have you seen in terms of, I guess the plight or I guess what's the question here is, what is the perspective of a media company? What do they want from their content creators? Well, I think that what all of the media companies are looking for is connection. And, um, you know, they want to have viewers engaged with their content. Um, so what they, and I'm not, I'm not associated with them in a sourcing of development. So I'm not in, I'm not privy to those conversations. I help once they've actually made a development decision, I may help create pitch materials to sell overseas rights or things like that. But, um, what I can say is the networks who have, um, been successful in carving out the original content, um, market piece and successful in terms of engaging with audiences are those where you've got a strong story, strong narrative and strong characters. You know, it's really people still, you know, there's a lot of talk these days around storytelling. It really still is about the story. You know, that really matters. You have to have, have the story, you have to connect, you know, and, but therefore you, you need that. You can't just have, well, you can, I suppose you can, have <laughs> you can do whatever you want. Right. Um, but you know, why do people watch wicked tuna? They don't watch wicked tuna because of the boats or the fish. They watch wicked tuna because of the characters, mm -hmm. you know? And so sometimes people can get distracted and you could even say, you see this in Hollywood where a film has a lot of special effects, but the writing's not there, you know? And so it falls flat. It doesn't matter how much whiz bang there is. If there's just not, if the writing's not there and the story's not there and the acting's not there. Yeah, it's interesting. The, you know, I also have come from not only filmmaking world, but the video game world because I had worked at Sony PlayStation for 12 years and uh, made movies for the PlayStation during my tenure there. And it was interesting because the filmmaking division, uh, the movies that we created for the in-game cinematics, uh, mm -hmm. in that industry was considered fluff. And because gameplay was the king, where... Um, stories king for film and you know television or books and so on of course but you know you could have a gorgeous looking game but if the gameplay was sluggish and slow or not interesting it it, it they would move on which is why when the um, app market came prevalent something like angry birds was just addictive and fun to play the gameplay was uh, the driving force and we had a struggle with our world in terms of being considered fluff is in the PlayStation, there was a common thing where you watch the movie once 
and you click X because you just want to get onto the gameplay. So, right. Yeah. Well, although I think as those things become, I think there you also have an issue of sophistication is you can become, is, is you can have your narrative, your story take place in this beautiful environment. It's then great, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so you know, what people, as technology allows you to do various things, I mean, it's a different experience, but you're still creating, you know, they're there in charge of the story. They want the gameplay. They want that part of the story. That's the experience they want. And, you know, it's also, it's understanding what it is, um, what it is that your audience wants, right? You know, should every brand have a brand story on Snapchat? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Complete waste of time shouldn't bother. There are all sorts of brands, which, you know, that just isn't the right place for them to be. Um, for some, it's the only place they should be, you know, it's understanding who your audience is. And if you're a filmmaker and you're making a film, uh, a young man sent me a film to get feedback on a rough cut today, actually. Hmm. And I looked at it and, you know, beautiful, some beautiful shots. And, and my, my main question, it was, you know, what is this, what are you, who are you showing this and why are you telling this story? What, what is the story you want to tell? Who, who's going to see it? What is, what is your mission? Because it wasn't evident to me what I was supposed to take away from it, you know, and, <laughs> yeah. and every story, you know, every film, it, it, it's an art form, but it's an art form that has a, has a purpose unless it's an abstract art form, you know, and if that's what it is, if that's the goal, then fine, fine. But the uh, outlets for abstract art films are very small. Right. I was curious because you brought up this concept of knowing who the audience is, and like knowing, you know, who you're supposed to be making this stuff for. Is there in your profession and, and working with all these um, high performers, high achievers, is there a system in place or something that like the small independent filmmaker, you know, as they're making their film, can keep in mind of how to the detect that um well they should know it going in i mean you shouldn't be made if you're if you, you should know before you turn on your camera who your story is for i mean absolutely you should know because that's and then that's part of your but if you want to approach a um a traditional player because you want to be purchased you know you want them to license your thing you want them to develop it into a program that's that's part of your pitch you're explaining what it is to them you know so you need to understand who, like, if you want to pitch something to um, a commercially supported network, commercially supported networks want to have, they want to get millennial viewers. So you need to, to say, okay, this, this is why that viewer wants this show. I mean, you know, it, it's understanding that, okay, you know, if you want instead to be shown an art house theater or you want you trying to sell your film to a distributor, you still want to tell, I mean, because ultimately it's, it's a, it's a commercial enterprise, you mm -hmm. know, and somebody is looking to make money on it. You've made the film and you're the wholesaler. You've made your, your widget. I mean, it's horrible to degrade a film into a widget, but your widget <laughs> it cost you this much, but ultimately that's, it, that's what it is. You know, you're trying to make a profit you're trying to make some money by selling it to a distributor. They're going to then mark it up and sell it to somebody else, you know, and, and so forth. It's not, um, unless you are doing, as I said, if you're making an art film and you're planning to put it, you know, to talk to a museum, you're still, why is this then, why is this interesting for a museum? You know, it, it, it's still what the, the, so what matters. I mean, the first film I made, my documentary, I, I got an NEA grant to, to put it together. Um, it was on esoteric book art. And, mm -hmm. I, and I, it was because I took the film over from somebody else who had started it. The, the book artist was dying of AIDS when the film was started. I actually never met him. I only had existing wild audio and, and one um, interview and then I found all the other footage which was another problem, um, <laughs> interviewed other people to flesh it out. And I sort of took it over because it was like, you know, this man was dying and he thought the film was being made about his art. And, and so for me, the purpose of the film was dying wish meets documenting an art form and a, a person who does something in this art form did. And, and it was a bit of an experiment to see, you know, I was a consultant. 
So, you know, this was different for me and I had a job and then I did this on nights and weekends until the NEA was going to demand a film and I had to quit and finish it. (laughs) Um, but when it came time, you know, I'd expended all this effort and made this film and it was finally done. Thank God. And I thought, Oh sugar, I've got to market the darn thing. (laughs) And it takes just as much effort to market it. And I thought, Oh God, why couldn't I have chosen something interesting and sexy that everybody would want to see instead of, you know, a subject that you've got to explain what the heck it is first. I mean, you know, it was really challenging. And I learned a lot about, you know, if it's hard to tell somebody in an elevator ride what your film's about, it's going to be hard to market. Yeah, I've seen that uh, come up with a lot of filmmakers um, because the advent of the tools are so um, readily available. You know, they're making their, their short, they're making their feature, but they're so excited they just finished. They're like, well, what, what do I do now? And just, at, you know, then you ask that that question point blank, well, who is the particular audience? And you'll get this glazed look, but sometimes... <laughs> you know, right, exactly. Yeah, but you'll get like uh, women 18, 35, you know? <laughs> like, okay, okay, well, how, you know, we got to break this down even further. So I was, didn't know, like, if there was... Um, do you guys have like a checklist you use or a questionnaire you use to try to to really get to the heart of who the audience might be uh, or like a well, way to test that? Dealing, well, when we're dealing with um, original scripted shows, networks have already invested a certain amount of money in, in acquiring the show and producing a season of programming. So we're let's say we're launching a show. Mm-hmm. Um, they tell us who they think, they, they've conducted research, who they think the audience is. And then we tell them, um, then we put together you know, this is the female cell spot. This is the male cell spot. This is your social media spots. This is what gets more shares and likes. Um, it's that kind of thing where we're working with them about understanding how things propagate, um, socially. And, you know, we don't control where, you know, we don't control where things are aired. We don't even, you know, ultimately we can only put forward what we believe is the best product we team with our clients. And so, they have definite opinions. They also test scenes. Um, and so they, you know, that scene didn't test well, this character, even though he's obviously the main character, everybody hates him. So we don't want to focus on him. We've (laughs) run into some tricky things, or you can have executives who, you know, work on a thing and it's for a a nature, you know, channel. Mm -hmm. And, um, you've done these spots and then it, comes down from on high that the executive doesn't like bees or birds or large mammals. I don't know. You're kind of like, well, that would have been helpful to know. Ahead oh, of time. yeah, yeah. You know, because because there are singular opinions. Leaders can have singular opinions, which then affect the creative and they are not market tested at all. It's just that person's point of view. As we've there's a lot of data. Um, we're in the world of big data a lot of analysis. And so some things are being driven by data, um, but other things are being driven by a singular point of view. Some networks have really strong leadership where they have a clear vision and clear opinion and, um, and that's worked well for them. Interesting. I don't know if I answered your question. (laughs) Oh yeah, yeah, no, no. It was, it was kind of like you're saying, okay, Hey, you know, the, it's been vetted to some extent. Now we need to find the the vehicles to reach the specific, you know, determined audience. And like you said, you just mentioned a, a handful of things that have to go into it to try to reach them most effectively. Um, out of curiosity, just like, you know, the millennials, um, is it the focus on them? Because that's a very interesting niche that you uh, describe on your uh, the about page at uh, Up Next, at the Up Next podcast. Is the um, is the purchasing power increasing with millennials? Um, is that why well, the it, media company is focusing the, on them? The focusing on them because they're where the change is. There's where the change is happening, and so um, you these are large ships, and they you know take time to shift. And if you're going to be building a library of, of material, it takes time to develop content and move content. So, and people then establish a habit. And when you have a habit that's in place, it's hard to change it. And so you have this very large cohort um, who is consuming media in a really different way. And their ways of consuming media are propagating 
downstream to their younger siblings and upstream to their parents. So um, you have the sort of buggy whips, elevator operators conundrum. You know, these things, change is happening, it will happen. So if this is the front end of change, you understand how they're consuming media, what kind of media they're interested in, you get them in the habit of coming to your place, then that will be the place that people come to. Well, Does that make sense? Yes. It's sort of, a, I think it was that whole Wayne Gretzky saying, like you skate to where the puck's going to be. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly what it is. <laughs> totally anticipating like the, the changes. Yeah, you need to, you anticipate the change because if you go for what's going on right now, you'll have missed it. And that's, that's, um, something that, I mean, you also realize who's steering these ships, these networks, they're not millennials, right? So, you know, um, you know, it, it's start, everybody should have a young mentor, <laughs> a reverse mentor to tell you what's what, you know, um, I started getting interested in it just by looking at my kids and how they were consuming media and how differently they were consuming media. Mm hmm. One of the things that I think is a, um, a bright spot, because a lot of this is, yeah, it's kind of not so bright, I guess, is I believe that we're on, that coming down the pike will be a change to the whole system that will be as significant to the system as it currently is, as the internet was to the system that preceded it. Okay. And I, I believe that blockchain technology, which is the technology that underlies Bitcoin, will disrupt and create real opportunity for content creators. I mean, really significant opportunity. Um, and uh, it is a way, it, it's a way that content creators will be able to directly interface and have micro payments with um, viewers. Interesting. So if we can unpack that a little bit more, because that's kind of a, a nugget there. <laughs> it, the, the, this concept of if we were skating to where the puck's going to be, if we're you know anticipating where the changes might be for a content creator of any type, obviously there's we're seeing the whole YouTube generation, YouTube creators um, with Casey Neistat, like that whole Samsung commercial that came out, I think, during the Oscars. Um, that was interesting because it was like, here you are, one industry – you know, kind of an, has history to it, you know, sh showing off uh, motion pictures with a lot of people um, had probably not even seen most of the films that were nominated. And then yet there was this commercial um, sponsored by Sa Samsung highlighting the all these new creators of that are very famous to young people, and especially the YouTube space. So where do you think, how does the this sort of Bitcoin technology or what the foundation that's built on how should a content creator sort of maybe anticipate or predict where this might go and set themselves up for creating content that um, is best suited for this, you know, this potential um, shift or disruption? Right. First of all, I want to just point out that that's a traditional media company grabbing on to people who they believe are attractive to millennials and associating their brand with them. So that totally relates to my earlier point of who mm -hmm. are they trying to get? What is the habit they're trying to build? Um, the blockchain technology, it, it's a technology. And so the companies that are going to be launching it are, are the earliest one that I'm aware of is going to, is, is shooting to be launched in the fall of this year. Um, but, and so you still have to think of who's your audience. You still have to think of, all of those things still hold true. So you're still making content that you believe is, is marketable and interesting and all of that. What this technology will end up doing is it will primarily, at least probably initially, it will incredibly disrupt YouTube hmm. because it is the, um, the, essentially imagine if all those really these, these YouTube people with huge followings, imagine if you could take out the YouTube middleman, imagine the income they could get. Right. 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 So why would they not move? And once our millennials who love these YouTubers start flowing over to this other platform and it's a viable platform, you can go for it. 
you see. I think that's how it's going to go. But you still have to have content that resonates with people. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I think more than anything, it's I think that people need to be aware and always aware of what the technology is offering, willing to try new platforms, keeping themselves informed to in that sense of, you know, so sure, you're a filmmaker, you're an artist, you're telling your story, but you're also a businessman or a businesswoman who needs to, you know, feed themselves and pay the rent. Um, you should be reading about what's going on. You should be keeping informed. Yeah, like um, I said, being aware of the marketplace or the, the well, because it's it's yeah, it's essentially the technology. It's really I can't really all I can say is Zach LeBeau, who I interviewed on the Up Next <laughs> podcast. Really, he's he's the one who's starting the video platform on blockchain, and and the interview talks about all of the different pieces and how it works, and it's worth a listen. Um, that's too silly. I apologize. No, but no, no. It's, that's, um, it's actually funny because it, it's one of the, that's my next question was like, you had all these guests. What were some of the highlights, ones that you, that really resonate with you? Well, I think in terms of ones that I think would be useful for your folks, also your audience. I mean, I think that one, Zach LeBeau, who's talking about blockchain and decentralized upgrading of the internet. That's a really fascinating one. And it offers a sort of light at the end of the tunnel to how people are experiencing life as a content creator now. Um, Tracy Johnson, who created Blue's Clues, mm -hmm. uh, she actually was really interesting. Tracy Johnson, Blue's Clues, perhaps the most successful, you know, children's program. She can't get a show on YouTube. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, doesn't that seem a little crazy? Yeah. Because she doesn't have a following. So, and they're not interested. She has shows on PBS. She does giant Blue's Clues. Hello, you know, Thanksgiving Day Parade inflatable um <laughs> amazon and yet that isn't a platform that's going to work for her because they're not they, they only want people who have already built their following so what's that tell you well maybe you want to while you're in school and college on the side you build your following you start with some shorts and you do it and you build yourself something because you, it it doesn't matter if you're already an established person they're not necessarily going to be interested in you the other thing is that she talked about um kickstarters and and how effective they are um, and how being really plugged in you are when you're doing a, a Kickstarter. But that's a, you know, cuts both ways and that it, it then sucks up a lot of your time because you've got to be interacting with people, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, um, everybody just talked about doing a launch. It's, it's, it is a launch, any type of product launch. You're just masking it as here's the, 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 the fundraiser, yes. the kicks, you know, uh, yeah, whatever. Exactly. Exa so it's, I mean, it's sort of, to, to the point I was saying about how exhausted I was at the end of making my film, you know, thank gosh, I didn't have these, <laughs> yeah, I did, there was no social media. Ah, it right. would have killed me <laughs> because it's only more work, you know, and you don't have more time in the day. You don't have more budget left over and, you know, you're sputtering and out of gas, but this is the final push that's going to get you over that hump. Um, you know, uh, then I also had spoken with um, Simon Taufik, and he had just uh, produced Imperium. And so he had some interesting views as somebody who's who's worked in an independent film and um, and also worked as a composer in professional environments. Mm -hmm. and um, uh, and certainly, you know, sees, one of the things that um, is challenging, you know, in the industry is getting the metrics, which then let you get to the next level. And so when you have something that has box office, that's in a regular theater, you can talk about box office. It's hard to get metrics with how many downloads or where are you on the iTunes list? Uh, you know, again, sort of the way big companies feel annoyed at these walled gardens with their secret numbers. Small independent producers similarly feel that way because they're like, well, what are my metrics? What am I selling? How can I prove that I'm a, um, a reliable thing to go with? Because, you know, studios and companies that are under siege because they're being disrupted want to go with a sure thing or mm -hmm. they want to hedge their bet. So it's a lot easier if you can say, I'm a YouTuber with this huge following, or I made an independent film and this is how well it did, you know, and you can tell people and those things help. Yeah. Interesting. What the, I was going to ask about 
what have you found, you know, working in your, your company that you built, uh, sort of drives you every day? Is it because you're, you're getting to make, you know, film content and creative content, but you have like, uh, some parameters to work with. Do you enjoy the parameters that make it challenging creatively? I love what I love, um, working with great original content. I mean, that's my job. I get to look at TV shows before they hit the air. That's cool. That's fun. You know, I like that. Um, I would like to cherry pick the shows I get to work on. I'd like to, you know, only work on the very best all the time. That'd be great. Um, you know, who wouldn't, uh, I also, you know, there are things that I'd like to develop, but you know, shoemakers, children, um, the things that I have sort of slowly nursing along in development are, are just going very slowly because there are, again, you know, time is a limiting factor. <laughs> well, I was curious, you, like, so you have to get, you know, this content out and like, you know, help to expand the reach. And I was wondering for like an independent, you know, obviously there's only so much somebody can do with a small team. Um, what have you seen or, or sort of perspective if you give somebody advice of like, uh, you know, they made an independent film or they have an independent web series of something of, of that ilk that says, how do I expand the reach? Even though I do have an understanding of who my audience is, um, how, do you, how do you match sort of like the things you need to do versus the reality of bandwidth? Like, and how do you, how would you recommend um, bridging those gaps, you know? Well, again, I think it, it really, what I would say would depend on the audience you were seeking to reach with it. Um, people are most likely to take recommendations from people they know. So pushing social in a smart way is probably a good investment of time rather than kind of fire hose posting or, you know, things like that. Um, anything that you can do to to have something propagate and then it takes them so that you have it's not just your effort it's then your friend who for free is sharing your content well they've just taken a little they've just done something for you for mm -hmm. free you know yeah. and not only that because they're a friend because because they're a real person with real opinions who has real friends that share that they made of your content will be you know, worth more than the sponsored post of NBC because it's a real person sharing something. Is Does there, that make sense? Oh yeah. I was wondering if, is there something like when you guys create something, uh, a piece of content or like, uh, how do you make sure that it, you kind of, well, there, are but things, how do you... there are things that there are things that tend to get shared more than others. You know, there are things that tend, people tend to like humor, so even in a in a dramatic program, humorous moments, people connect again with characters. And so focusing on characters is important. Um, you know, if you're doing like Instagram photos and things like that, you may have a really arty, desolate photograph for the I don't know, let's say the film takes place in upstate New York and it's creepy. Mm -hmm. um, that photograph won't get as much traction as a photograph of a person. It just because of how people react, how there and there are plenty. Again, here's where doing a little bit of research, reading up on it, finding out, you know, the time you spend researching and reading about what people tend to react to will pay off in spades. Oh, so I because I remember this sort of like with uh, they did like a little bit of analysis like on YouTube thumbnails. And we watched like the evolution of like the YouTube thumbnails go from when they didn't, you know, fix their ag algorithm where it was like a, a girl in a bikini and you would click it and it had nothing to do with the video. Right. And they changed that, you know, to, to avoid that kind of clickbaitedness. Uh, but now it's like any uh, clip within the video that shows maybe somebody's face that's sort of looking into the camera and they have like a very you know, they're smiling or they're like their mouth's open or something shocking. Like the, all those like, um, um, video essays that have been popping up of like people's reaction to a trailer, you know? So, you know, you right. watch the movie trailer and then there's people's reaction to it. But the, the, the thumbnail they have with it is somebody's like eyes are wide open, you know, 
and that's like right. the clickbait. So when you're crafting, you know, your, I guess your content for these campaigns, does that try to go into account? Like maybe this might be something that would be sh shareable. Like this is, uh, things right. Like we that. also, you think about length, um, you know, obviously that's the other thing is short. People have like the attention span of a goldfish. So you've got to <laughs> do it fast. Um, you know, most things play silent. So it's got to, you've got to be able to read, you know, not, not necessarily text. I, I mean, it's got to be a visual read. So it's got to be a quick, you need to understand what you're seeing quickly, easily. Um, and those things are all, you know, sometimes you can find yourself, you've made your film and then you think, oh, we don't have any trailer moment. I mean, you know, there's some thinking that it's worth doing ahead of time. Like while you still have your script thinking about, well, how would we promote this? What, what, sh how would we do it? What are the moments that we think are going to be big or interesting and how, how can we make sure that down the road, we're not going to run into trouble? You know, usually once you start the actual production, you don't have much time. You're very crunched. So if you can do a lot of prep in advance and really think about it, it will save you headaches at the back end. Yeah. So when you, when you have, like, do you have a team, like how many people are in place to, to break down, like, okay, here's the original content coming on our plate. Um, we have a, we understand the cast of characters, the, the story arc, the story cell, and um, let's start analyzing or deciding. It depends. I mean, it, it depends how, what our deadlines are. I mean, that's really, you know, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? I don't know. You know it, it, <laughs> I can't really, I, I don't know. Uh, it depends on what the schedule is. You know, we make our deadlines and we staff it as we make it. I mean, I think ultimately if you're, you know, when you're, when you're cutting a trailer, mm -hmm. like it, let's talk traditionally, you're cutting a trailer, the editor actually needs to be the person screening material. I can, I can have, um, assistance, pre-screen and, and weed out various things so that all the best nuggets are in one spot, but they really have to have their arms around the footage so that they can play and, and make connections. And it really, there is creative artistry. The trailers are their own art in, in many ways. I mean, I think one of the things that um, oftentimes gets lost uh, when people, certainly when brands are talking is that you have to have demand. And so the reason people watch trailers is because they're, they're almost their own thing, you know? Um, whereas if you're, I mean, the, I mean, how many people other than let's say the Super Bowl, how many people are like, Ooh, let's sit down and watch commercials. You know, eh, it's not so much. Right. Right. It's interesting. I remember, uh, gosh, when iTunes, uh, sort of came about they had a section for movie trailers and uh, that became a thing where you, you could go to a coffee shop and look br bring up your iTunes and start you know looking through movie trailers now there's a whole other segment to it and I saw something on YouTube the other day it was interesting it was like the new uh, Justice League uh, movie trailer and the comments below were like you know this is so inception or so meta where I had to wait through a commercial to see another commercial. <laughs> right, right, right. And yet the person did it, you know? So yeah. what's that What's that to say? I mean, I think that the, an audience is created by demand. You know, there's demand for music. There's a demand for movies. There's a demand for shows. There is a demand for laughter. Um, and where there's demand, there's an audience. And so that goes to what are you making? Is there going to be a demand for it? Yeah. Let me ask you with the trailers being so significant and impactful to really any sort of film content in the space that we're talking about. What have you seen with your team? Has there been sort of not like a formula, but how is the approach to creating these short trailers that might be thrown up on Snapchat or Instagram, you know, in a square, you know, format maybe, or Facebook that's like runs. Well, yeah, seconds. I don't see, I don't think that there is where I would say that you shouldn't you design for your medium. So mm -hmm. you're absolutely not going to toss your two minute theatrical trailer onto Snapchat, you know, cause you're designing for your aspect ratio. It's not just, you're changing your aspect ratio, even though you are you, because how things are framed, how it's, it's different. So you're going to design for your medium. So there's that sort of the, the first thing. 
And then for me, I, I think it's always evolving. The minute I can say there's a pattern is when I think it's not as interesting. Mm, okay. Um, for, for me, I mean, one of the things I'm kind of appalled at some of the trailers I've seen, like, did you see the, um, the latest aliens trailer? Why go to the film? Like, why did they do that? I... <laughs> Not yet, but I'll take a look well, at so, that. So you'll take a look at it, and then you'll be like, I don't need to see the movie, because I saw the trailer. I, I, I don't understand that. Or, you know, the Fast and the Furious. What, what, I, uh, so, uh, we did not do those. Right. <laughs> well, it's interesting that I just saw the latest Spider-Man. They just released it uh, this morning. I haven't seen that one, but I saw the other day, they did this short, like, 15 10 second teaser that was yeah. shot in cropped in not shot but it was cropped in the square format and it was obviously yeah. used for instagram or facebook or you know snapchat and it was just yeah. to show um this mechanical bug that's part of his suit and that got the the demand the buzz you know the fanboys talking because then there was this whole these all these youtube videos commenting on what they just saw and yet it was interesting because the original source was a square you know, 15 second teaser. Um, right. and well, and how perfect. See there you've got, you've got all these people who are amplifying that marketing effort. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a win. Is there any way like when you identify sort of the regular Joe that is, you know, sharing it out of enthusiasm, do you, are you able to identify that and then put more, you know, gasoline on the fire, which is like somebody who's like, shared this with a bunch of friends to say, Thank I, you. I don't, that's again, we're working. Our client is the people are the people, the gatekeepers for mm. that. So we're making the content for them. And then we do not get to, um, determine where it's placed, how it's placed, how it's blown out, how it's followed up with at all. Oh, bummer. Yes. <laughs> like, bummer, I, I mean, Cause it's, it's curious. Cause like you, you have a piece of work that is somebody's champing in. You kind of like, Oh, thank you. Like reaching out to them where they feel special and make them more special, feel more special. Then you give them well, more content to share. <laughs> well, sure. And you can have super fans. I mean, you know, I'm sure, you know, that's where you, you start talking about engagement and, you know, networks that really manage the engagement um, networks or brands or other people where you have people interacting with your brand. You want to encourage and engage with them. It's a lot of work to do that. But that's what people are. It's a conversation, mm -hmm. you know, it's a push and a pull. It's not just a billboard, you know, right. Or ideally, it's not just a billboard. Do you ever seen the uh, HBO show Fly of the Concords? I love that show. <laughs> so, you know, they, they have the one raving fan. The, the one oh, that's, I know. She's, <laughs> she's, she's so great. <laughs> so there's this concept there. It's like, well, you got to double down on the one fan you have, you know, <laughs> <laughs> she's awesome. Yeah, she's so and she's a great um comedian. Yeah, uh, definitely. She's yeah. so funny. So, I also love Murray. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes, all the Murrayism. And that's yeah. great cuz these characters are rich and unique and they become memes and the, the concept right. of meme is can be shareable and um and sort of ingraining that stuff into the, the psyche. And again, it's so hard cuz it's man, we are just media like content just flashing before our eyes are just overwhelmed to have something stick with us is a, uh, is a testament to whatever the, you know, the core of it was. Right. Right. Absolutely. Well, we can wrap this up. I, you know, I was wondering if there's any other last bit of information maybe I didn't cover that you thought might be really valuable. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting here that this concept of disruption and, and, and knowing it's going to happen and also knowing to try to anticipate where the puck's going to be, you know, Right. Too. Well, I think that that's, I mean, I think from a, from a filmmaker, um, from a filmmaker point of view and from somebody who's creating content either as, as their main source of income or as a labor of love, which they'd love to have be a greater part of their life and career, um, being aware of new channels and new opportunities and really looking to exploit them before they're too solidified so that you can exploit being a first mover. It's the people who were on YouTube first mm -hmm. that were able to really shape it and benefit from it. And so as new things come out, new technologies come out, try them, explore with them, you know, play with them and, and network with people because 
it's creating those networks. It's sh- it's sharing things um, that will amplify and push ideas forward. Nice, very nice. Well, thank you so much. I'll make sure for everybody, you know, it gets pointed towards the podcast and the work that you're doing over there at Up Next. It's fantastic. It's really the guests you have are bonkers. So. <laughs> <laughs> In the best possible way. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that's my word saying like that's like that's like sick. That's like oh, that's crazy. That's crazy good. You know, <laughs> my slang. <laughs> Excellent. I love it. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been really pleasurable to talk to you about this stuff. Very cool, and, and look forward to um, you know seeing other work that you might be putting out, and um, I'll follow up with you as well to uh, to put more links and backlinks to. Um, all the work you're doing and so people get a chance to you know see what you're doing as well so hear what you're doing <laughs> great thanks so much take care and that concludes my interview with Gabriella Mirabelli from the Up Next podcast be sure to check out our show when you can and I'll leave the links in the show notes uh, for you again that's at Up Next podcast you can search on it you know search on it, or you can search for it on iTunes or Stitcher Radio or Google Play or whatever you know podcast app that you use to listen to podcasts. If you like this interview, please think about leaving a ratings and review over an iTunes for me. Just go to filmtrooper.com forward slash iTunes. That will take you to the iTunes page. And any ratings and review would be very, very helpful in spreading the word about this particular podcast. And of course, don't go away empty handed because I have a free gift for you over at freegearguide.com. It's an equipment list of everything I use to make a feature film for $500 without a crew. Again, that's at freegearguide.com. Thanks so much for tuning in, and I will see you next time. Film Trooper, filmmaking freedom for the independent.